Welcome to the Adventures Club. Uh, we're here tonight uh, to give you another program, keeping our safe COVID distance from each other, playing it safe. Uh, really appreciate you joining us tonight. We're gonna have a very interesting to talk and uh, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Carl Palazzolo, uh, doctor of veterinary medicine. Uh, he works at the uh, Long Beach Animal Hospital and uh, he does a lot of wildlife rescue and work with wildlife and uh, photography related to that. So we're looking forward to an interesting evening tonight. Carl? Thank you, Ken, for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, when I talk about going to Borneo, most people go, oh, where the heck is that? <laughs> and how did you get interested in going on a trip like that? So it started when I was growing up. As a young man, I watched all those TV shows about wildlife on TV, and one of them was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon huh. Perkins, a classic show then. And one time they had a show on Borneo and all those crazy animals and the orangutans. And I said, that place looks fascinating. One day I think I gotta go there. Well, I'm a youngster at the time watching all these TV shows. Roll ahead now, high school, college, go to veterinary school at Michigan State. I'm a busy guy. Started building my practice, working hard, working hard. Finally, as I got my travel bug in my 30s or so, I saw this ad for an organization called Earthwatch, earthwatch.org, wonderful organization. I've been on multiple trips with them where you can basically go and join a research team and be with a bona fide researcher and do some field work with people out there and you're right in the ground doing some really neat stuff. Huh. They had a trip on the orangutans in Borneo with Dr. Baruti Galdicus. She's a pioneer in working with orangutans. And I said, I'm going. And I did, huh. and that was back in 1991. So one of the things, first off, when you go to Borneo, you're going a long distance. You fly from LA, either through Hong Kong or Singapore to Jakarta, Indonesia, and then from Jakarta, you fly across the Java Sea to the island of Borneo. So now Borneo is not a country, it is an island. It's the third largest island in the world, and most people get the first, Greenland's the largest, but most people do not get the second largest, and that is Erie and Jaira, New Guinea. Hmm. So Borneo is an island made of three countries, one is Brunei, where the Sultan of Brunei lives, which used to be the richest man in the world. <laughs> and then Malaysia. And then the other part of Borneo, the largest part is Indonesia, and it's called Kalimantan. So it's really three different countries, and the part we're gonna go to is Kalimantan, and more specifically, a place called Tajan Puting National Park. So you fly to Jakarta, you spend the night there, it's a big teeming city, it's just like a Mexico city. And then the next day you fly on this, we'll call it a puddle jumper plane, or with the Java Sea into where you're gonna go in Borneo for your research. Well, it's kind of like, I might call it a rickety plane, to put it mildly. Yes. And so when you get to the other end, the people that meet you there say, how was the flight, of course, because they're familiar with this little flight. And we go, it was fine, it was no problem. They go, don't worry, no one told you this, but the mechanic that works on the plane is required to fly on that flight. Oh. So that's a good idea. So we he has like incentive. That. <laughs> yeah. Good incentive to do a good job there. So what happens is we fly there, everything works out fine. It's a jungle, it's amazing. And so we're gonna go there and we're gonna start going to a place called Tanjung Puting National Park. But as soon as you get there, these countries are starved for money. So one of the first things they do is you meet the bankers. They wanna convert your cash to their yes. currency because they need American dollars so badly too. Then you go shopping at the supermarket and eventually you get on a boat called a Klatak. It's a single cylinder diesel engine boat and you go kuka 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 and you slowly work your way up these river called the Sakanya River and you make it eventually to your final destination called Camp Leakey. Huh. And it's called Camp Leakey for a reason, because this place is named after Louis Leakey, the famous anthropologist. So he sent out three people. Most people know Jane Goodall went to work with the monkey, the uh, chimpanzees in Gambi Reserve, yeah. and then uh, Diane Fossey for the gorillas in Rwanda. And then he also sent out Baruti Galdicus to work with the orangutans in Borneo with her husband, Rob Brindamore, in the 1971s. We'll come back to her in a second because she's just the pioneer. She's done all the work for that. So we go to this trip, get to the clock talk, and on the way up there, you have to stop at several places. And as you do, you meet some of the orangutans that are there, and they've got staging areas where the orangutans are being rehabilitated to go back into the wild. And it's just fascinating, okay? You got these ex-captives, many orangutans, their babies, their mothers were damaged from the palmel plantations, taking them from that. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And they're just trying to rehabilitate these babies and put them back into the well. So when I first got there, there was a bunch of sick ones, and I had a chance to examine them. And when you say examine them, 
it's kind of like you say that loosely because they examine you as much as you examine them. Huh. It's hilarious, okay? And so what you have is a situation where you have people helping you and they're rolling these babies in and they had themselves um, just a blast just working with these babies. So before we go much further, can you put the, throw the photo on the map of Borneo, the first one, so people can see what it's like then? So you can see all the orange part there. That's the Indonesia part of Borneo in the center. It's on the equator, and that's Kalimantan. And you can see there under the N of Indonesia, that's about where we were, okay, in the part of it. So away we go, and we spend day after day getting up early in the morning out in this jungle, and we're just doing basic research on finding out more about the orangutans. So it turns out there's been hundreds of thousands of hours done in the orangutan research over these decades. So our mornings were getting up early and working with the babies, working with the animals, doing the best we can, and hanging around the camp with these ex-captives. And it was just hilarious in some of the things we would do. There's a long bridge from the water where the boat entered the camp to you went to your campsite, and you had to pay the toll. There would be a juvenile orangutan sitting there sometimes, and if you didn't give him soap or some food, some candy, he would grab your ankle. <laughs> and if you didn't have the food, he'd hang on, and they're so strong you wouldn't be able to get away. So you a have little to bit of extortion help. going on. Eh? Yeah, you have, to, you have to pay the toll on the bridge, as I would say. You know? And these orangutans would brush their teeth in front of you. They have iron stomachs. They would wash their skin with soap and just lick the soap off. They would pretend they were drunk drinking Gatorade. It was just hilarious being with these ex-captives that were used to people. That's the fun part of it. And then, of course, if you're going to go to Indonesia, they warn you in the beginning, you're going to have to eat rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. Every meal's got rice in it. And they have some good traditions. One of them is the fact that when you come to dinner, because they had a lot of people there, a lot of researchers, people from over the world doing research, and they had some nice, what I call, good traditions at dinner. One of them is the fact that at dinner, you don't start eating until everyone's present. The second one is you don't blow your nose at dinner. <laughs> and the third, you don't show your feet. This is a Muslim country. Oh. It's got okay. the most Muslim population in any country in the whole world, the largest one, Indonesia. And so mm -hmm. they had some wonderful, respectful traditions that they would go ahead and do. And so you had a chance to interact with these people. And the young men that took you out to the jungle every day, they're called Dayaks. And you're not allowed to go out in the jungle unless you're with them, because it's got some inherent dangers. And these young Dayak men had such a keen skill. They could hear things, see things, feel things. And what they would do was take you out every day. And it turns out that as I learned more about these Dayaks, their ancestors were the headhunters of Borneo. Yes. Headhunting no, stopped in World War II a long time ago, but they got a tremendous skill. And so you're not allowed to go out in the jungle unless you're with them all the time. And the biggest danger in the jungle amongst all the poisonous snakes and the orangutans and all those wild things, can you guess what that is? No idea. It's tree branches falling on your head. Oh. Because <laughs> you know, there's so much vegetation and it's rotting. It's a peat jungle. And what will happen is it will just come right down on top of your head and be dangerous. Huh. So hanging around the camp are the babies, of course, the ex-captives being reintroduced back into the wild. But also occasionally one of the large males would come around just checking things out. These guys are 300 pounds. They're as strong as eight men and they're not afraid of us at all. But what's so interesting is the man that ran the camp, the young man, the older man, excuse me, he probably weighed 90 pounds. And this 300 pound male orangutan's afraid of him. Oh, if really? he would just take a stick, the orangutan would. So I wanted a photo with the orangutans and we got it. It was kind of fun with him bringing the male orangutan whose hands are like this big near us and we had a good opportunity to you know, interact with them. So yeah. it was just fantastic, yeah. A lot of things happen over there that are interesting. For example, all during the trip, we were accompanied by a police officer. Okay, we don't know why he was there. His name was Btop. And by the way, you call everybody by their first name, but you say Mister in front of it. So a man named Uwil was taking us around. His name is Mister Uwil. So mm -hmm. Mister Btop accompanied us all the time. Which again, I don't know why that happened. Is he assigned by the government, or well, you got to figure that. But you know, <laughs> there's nothing we're doing that's going to be anything secret. Yes. There's no propaganda, so it's kind of funny. Just show how the government's controlling, you know. But mm -hmm. everything was on the up and up. There was no problem. So we would go out there with Mr. Btop and Mr. Uwil, and we luckily we went there in the time of year where it was not the rainy season, because in that part of the world, there are no seasons. Okay, it's on the equator. The sun gets up at the same time every day, and it sets at the same time every day. And so you have no season like we used to, but they have a rainy season and a dry season. Hmm. And lucky I went there during the dry season, because if it's the rainy season, you're walking in water up to your knees and higher all the time. Hmm. So they go out in the morning and they show the things about, watch this plant because it's got something that'll scrape you and irritate you and don't touch that and pinch your plant. So it was just fascinating to be out there in the jungle with those people. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. 
So that was the first trip we went on, and there's okay. much more of that. And luckily for me, being a veterinarian, Mr. Uo, the most experienced man in the jungle, one day as the group's going to do their assignment, he grabbed me and goes, you're with me, you're the vet. And we got to go kayaking and canoeing in the area. We got to see proboscis monkeys. He showed me pitcher plants and rubber trees, and just I had an opportunity to, we'll call it male bomb with this man, and he went out of his way, we did a great time. And so our day, we usually started as we got up early in the morning at four o'clock, because we go out to an orangutan built a nest the night before, because they build nests every night. And we'd wait oh. below them in our hammocks. Four o'clock in the morning, the cicadas would go off like a fire alarm. It was so loud, and the sun would come up and hear the orangutan rustle, and they start moving around, and we'd follow them all day long. And whenever the orangutan stopped, we'd put our, um, our, our hammocks out there, and we would sit there, and the rest of them kept on going. And ate our rice for lunch. <laughs> now, you said you went upriver. About how far? Or how long did it it's take a two-day up trip upriver, so you start at a town called Kumai, That's and you go up for one day on the Klatok to a town called Rimba. You spend the night there to get your permit to go into the national park called Tanjung Puting National Park. Then after that, another day up the Sakanya River where there's Nipa palms and the boat gets stuck and the guy's got to dive in under the propeller. All along you is the jungle, and it's just you're right there in the middle of the jungle. So. It really was a good part of the trip for us just to be able to go up river like that and spend two days just enjoying this kick, 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 kick up the river. Almost like the African Queen, the Humphrey Bogart. Okay. <laughs> yes, like that. perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that uh, you keep talking about the captive mm -hmm. wrong at times. Are the, um, tell us about that. So what happens is because right now there's a big demand for land for palm oil trees, for what we use here for cosmetics, and for timber, they're tearing a lot of that down. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is they'll kill the female orangutan. Up to 1,500 to kill it each year, and there's a baby left over. Uh -huh. and so those babies go to what's called the orangutan uh, conservation research center there, and they're raising them because orangutans need their mother for eight to 10 years. They nurse up to eight years. There's uh -huh. a lot of interaction with the mother, a lot to learn. And so what happens is now they have no mothers. So they bring them to the rehab center there, and the people become the mother and take care of them and reintroduce them to the wild by bringing them out to the little bit of jungle, play with each other, and hopefully over, you know, four, five, six, seven years, they bring them back out into the jungle. But the problem is the jungle is going away. Yeah, so no place to go. No place to go, and that's the biggest problem. Mm. That must be, uh, that's a long period to interact with them. Mm. That, that must develop quite a bond between the people and the... And very much so, yeah, they're dedicated. Most of them are all Indonesians, local people with volunteers from around the world. When I was there, the first time we were there, it was like three men and nine women, 12 of us, but they had people from all over the world they're helping out because it's such a unique thing. This animal is going extinct. It's our cousin that's got the, almost the same DNA as we do, and pretty much they're going away because the land is going away. Wow. So it's a terrible situation right now, too. And that was on the first trip we saw that. On the second trip, 21 years later, you saw it even worse than two. Wow. So the land is going away so much that they're having a hard time getting food. Orangutans eat almost exclusively fruit. There's 300 types of fruit they need to eat, and with less land, they can find it. So back in 1991, to help them, especially the females with young, they would go ahead and every day at 4 o'clock make a concoction of rice and milk, and then they'd bring it out to a feeding platform, and they would have the orangutans then eat the food to get some strength and nutrition. So they don't even escape the rice then? It's hard meals. to get away even for them, okay, yeah. But they need the nutrition because it's going, and that's when the big males would come around to find out which females are receptive to them because they tend to be loners, okay? So I'm gonna show you a picture of that later on. So, so it really was a bad problem in 1991, and it got even worse later on then. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the orangutans. Um, kind of, Physically, you said they, we share a high percentage of DNA with them. Yeah, about 97%, yeah. That's so first off, they're called orangutans, not orangutan. There's no G at the end. And it means basically person or man of the forest. It's a melee word. Sure. And so they've been around, obviously, for a long period of time. And they uh, and us, human beings and orangutans, have about 97% of the same DNA. So they're pretty much our cousins. And what's happened is now there's only three species now, one in Sumatra, which is Indonesia, and the other one's in Borneo, Indonesia. And that's the only place in the world they exist. And as I said, it's just going away more and more. We're encroaching upon the land more and more. So all on the same it. island? Two different islands, Sumatra Two, and okay. then Borneo. Okay. Okay. And so there's several different species, and they're the biggest arboreal animal on the planet. They spend 95% of their time in the trees. 
They rarely come down. The males will come down every once in a while, but the females rarely come down. And they have elongated hands and very powerful muscles. And they actually do something called quadruminous moving. They actually walk kind of in the jungle with their hands, almost like they're walking in the ground because they use their feet as hands also. Ah. It's interesting because they got toes on their feet that are opposable, and they walk with their feet in the jungle along with their hands. Oh, just, and they can, they got hips that are flexible, so they can be like in three directions, almost like a, a Olympic athlete, but even more flexible than that at hundreds of pounds. Yeah. Now, how, how high are they in the canopy? Anywhere from 50 to 100 feet up there. They spend most of their time up oh. there. That's where their leaves and fruits are. So they spend, like I said, almost all their time out there in the middle of the forest, up in the jungle, high in the trees. That's a long way up. Yeah, well, they're used to that. Yes. <laughs> that's what the mothers have to teach the babies how to do that when they're young, and that's when they rehabilitate them at the orangutan conservation project. They actually go ahead and teach them how to climb out the trees. They take them out there and put them out there, and they got to show them what to do. So they're like human beings. They take they they have a huge potential to learn, but unfortunately, it needs someone to teach them along the way. Yeah. It takes a long period of time. It's like the same learning curve as humans, almost. Very much so, too, yeah. <laughs> and they only give birth um, once they're 15 years of age or longer, and they only give birth in their lifetime about maybe two or three times, every seven oh. years or so. So the reproductive rate is not very fast. So very limited. As a result, they can be very limited when it comes to having a problem with them you know, going away. And so on our first trip there, we got a chance to see how the jungle was being destroyed, and we went to a place that was called the Alluvial Goldfields, and we saw how they did mining there. And it's just amazing with the mining how the land has been devastated. You can see it all right there. Mm -hmm. So the first trip, going back to that again, because we'll come to the second trip in a second, it just was so insightful how wonderful these people are. They're so warm and caring people. They're so thankful that we took the time to come there and help them with their problem. They respect our education. And so the last day when we were there, they had a going away ceremony for us. It was very heartwarming. It was wonderful. They sing and dance, and they gave us these hardwood spears that the airlines weren't too happy that we brought them on the airlines later on. <laughs> but one of the best parts of that ceremony was at the very end, they had a young man there playing the guitar. Okay, Well, he knew a song, and that song was Hey Jude. So we played Hey Jude all <laughs> night long, over and over. It was really a wonderful time. Yeah. I've and been so, places like that. <laughs> yeah. And so the people were just fantastic. Yeah. And so we did that wonderful trip, and. I come back to work and practice, and the next thing you know, I've got myself all caught up in my work. And one day, one of my friends goes, you know, we want to go back to that place you've been there. And so I went back in 2012. And that was another fantastic trip. I learned so much more about the jungle going away, and it was just unbelievable. So before we go to that, let's go to the next picture. I'll show you about the place, OK? It's the one with the National Geographic. So this place has been on the cover of National Geographic two times. That's Baruti Galdicus right there. And that's her son. So it's a famous place. It's been loaned quite a bit then. Mm -hmm. And go to the next one. Mm -hmm. And this gives you an idea on this next picture about how this is in 1991, how wow. the trees have been destroyed. This is for the gold field, but the same thing's happening with the palm oil plantations and how bad it's it can be over there. Completely barren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. So then go to the next picture. Mm -hmm. And this is how we take care of some of the babies. Okay, this is the second trip. So on the second trip, we went ahead and went there, and we spent more time with the babies at the conservation center there. And it was just fantastic, OK? And if you go to the next trip, the picture, you'll see what we did. Pretty much, we took them from their cages, <laughs> put them in a wheelbarrow, and gave them a chance to go out and play in the jungle every day. Oh, that's so wonderful. On the second trip, it wasn't 12 people. It was just three of us, me and two uh, friends and a veterinarian. And uh, again, just a fantastic time. This time, we didn't stay at the camp where everybody was, we stayed at a man named Poxia's place right across the street from the Orangutan Conservation Center there too. And just wonderful people, okay? Yeah. And a big warning if you plan on going to that part of the road, it is hot and humid. It's intensely hot and humid. Yes. <laughs> so at the first night of laying there and going, I can't sleep, we got a fan. And that's about all we had. That was enough to get us by. Right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that comfortable. So you got to make an adjustment when time goes to this place because no matter what time of year, it's intensely hot and humid. So when you take a wheelbarrow mm -hmm. full of them out into the jungle, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you have to keep them rounded up, or do they tend to well, stay close? Well, interesting or? question, because once you take them out of their cage and put them in that wheelbarrow, they know they're going to go play in the jungle. Uh. 
they sit there like behaving children. It was interesting, okay? <laughs> and we, we, everybody, someone grabbed a mirror, one here and one in the wheelbarrow, that wheelbarrow's full, okay, we got, let's go. And we go out there with 10, 15, 20 of them and let them go and they would just play like crazy. And what brought them back was peanuts. They love peanuts. Uh, so one of the guys with the bag of peanuts, they come running and get the peanuts and we'd take them all back then. And that was pretty much every day as much as we could. Okay. So it was more of a baby trip the second time. And since I had three women with me, once they hugged on one of these babies, they didn't want to let go. Mm -hmm. So some of the babies are very young, we would bottle feed them, we'd burp them, it's amazing. Other ones were what we call maybe juveniles, were spending more time out there in the jungle and they're very strong. And so they were stubborn, they're like teenagers. And yes. they would want to get their way in there too. So it was just fascinating to be with these babies. You sit down and they would just attack you and look for peanuts and go through your pockets and so, just like little kids. So that was probably the height of the trip and the second trip of doing that. Now, when they're out there, are they, is this in part to help teach them life skills? Yes, that's what we're trying to do without their mother. Yeah. So people like Baruti Galdagus, who spent all those years researching them, she knows what they need. She's observed their mothers over many, many decades, hundreds of thousands of hours of research, and our researchers helping them, so they know what they need, and they're just trying to replace the mother. And so it's not an easy situation, because it's hard to replace the original mother. Yeah. They're doing the best they can. So. What kind of uh, what kind of staffing is is in this um, rehab center? Well, pretty much it's all native Indonesian people mm -hmm. who are working there just to learn a skill and to make some money. And so money is always important. And by the way, the Orangutan Foundation International, Dr. Galdus's organization, is here in Los Angeles. You can learn about them from orangutan.org, okay? Huh. And so okay. they're always looking for money, and the money they use, they go over there and they pay these people as full time jobs. Then they have researchers and they have students and volunteers come from around the world and people come from everywhere. And the young people that want to get their maybe PhD in zoology or mammalogy or primatology, they'll come there and work there for six months or a year to get the experience on their resume. Uh -huh. And they get a fantastic experience then. And then they sometimes come back and help out. So it goes in all different kinds of directions, but they need volunteers a lot. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, through Earthwatch, all that has stopped now because of COVID and things, and so it's yeah. been a little damper for them. Like any one of the Earthwatch projects, all of them have had a damper put on them. And they've been a lot of source of funding for some of these organizations, too, because you pay Earthwatch to go on the trip, you get a great trip, but some of the funding goes to the organization you're going to be with, like the Orangutan organization. That's a good arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it works. Mm -hmm. Now, do they... Um they have medical care facilities for the... They have veterinarians there, too, that work with them, too, because yeah. they get a wide variety of diseases like people, tuberculosis, yeah. mange, I mean, a lot of parasites. They need ivermectin all the time, drugs we bring to them on the trip because these animals are out in the jungle. The stress of captivity brings out parasites sometimes, too, but they have a lot of problems. And then uh, there's trauma. When the males yeah. get together, they're very territorial. They have these cheek pads, they're called flanges, and they do what's called a long call where they make a bellowing call to tell other males, it goes up to a mile, this call, other males that stay away or tell the females, I'm looking for you, where are you, let's get together. And the males will fight, okay, and they'll injure each other. And sometimes mm -hmm. I've heard, I didn't see this, very seriously. And they'll maim themselves, they lose an eye, and so they have to put them back together sometimes, if they can yeah. even find them. Yeah. I'll bet that's a bigger job to tend to them than the babies. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's more traumatic things. And the males just stay away. You don't go near them. They don't want you near them. They come around when the females are receptive. Otherwise, you don't see them too much except the feeding time. Now, the feeding is a little different now. When you go up to Camp Leakey, you're going to go to an area now that's where the tourists to come see the feeding. It's more organized. They have seats to sit there, and the park rangers come out there, and they bring out the food. And as a result, then, you have all these people watching, and these orangutans come by the ton. But first comes the males, the large males. Ah. We'll show that picture in a second. And then when he eats first, because he's checking to see what's going on, he's very intimidating. He's 300 pounds. One guy was named Doyak. And then once he has this fill, he leaves. And then the younger ones come, and they eat. And then the females with the babies come at the end, and they get all the food they want. And then you have the other animals, like the gibbons, sneaking in there and grabbing the rice and coming around taking bananas. Dropping. It's hilarious, okay? <laughs> it's quite interesting. So actually, even though we're not going to show many pictures tonight, on the website for my animal hospital, the Long yes. Beach Animal Hospital, so it's lbah.com. Don't forget the A, lbah.com. Go on the photography link in the top right of the home page and scroll down. You'll see many photos and videos of all this. So we've got much more to show on the website. 
And we'll put some of these links in the in the video description also, okay, later, so right. okay, people that are watching this later yeah, will good. be able to get over there. We can do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these babies are just, it's all about these young babies and educating people in the area because what's happened, besides the trading of the, um, the forest going away and the animals going away, there's the illegal trade of poaching these babies. And they go to Taiwan and Singapore and things like that. And so because the Baruti Galdica is really doing a great job in this, she got the authorities to get together with them and they go and they confiscate these babies and take them back. Because uh. a person can't care for them. What yeah. happens? They start getting to be two, three years of age, and they're fifty, hundred pounds, and they're so powerful. How are you going to take care of them? So they so can't do. So it's a that. it's a pet trade. There's an illegal pet trade, uh huh? And that's been stomped down a little bit, but it still exists. Yeah. Okay, people just think they're so cute, we're going to get them, and they don't realize they're not cute when they get bigger and older. And they're <laughs> a very powerful animal. Yeah. Now, what's the um, what's the social structure mm -hmm. for them in in nature? Well, they're like a semi social structure in that the males just stay away. They're just territorial. They all come around when the females are receptive or when there's food. The females have that kind of loose social structure. The daughters stay with the mothers for a long period of time. Females intermingle. The adults, sometimes they don't. They're kind of a fluid situation with the males just kind of coming around every once in a while. And then when a young male becomes older, then he's pushed out and he's got to find his territory and fight his way up. And that takes a long time. And if there's a large male there with the big cheek pads, those flanges, yeah. by his sound, he actually subdues the other male's hormones, they think. He doesn't develop the big cheek pads. Then when that other male gets displaced or he dies, then the younger ones, even though they might be 30, 40 years of age, by the way, they live to 45, 50, 65 years of age, then when he's maybe 30, 40, he develops them. So there's a lot of interaction going on that you can't see, even though they're isolated. They have a communication that we don't really have. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So is there, uh, their environment is endangered. Seriously. They have no place to live. M majority, yeah. uh, since 1903, something like 97% of the orangutans are down in population. Yeah. Is there any, um, is this largely private effort or is this partly funded by the, probably the same government who's granting all the tree cutting and farming. <laughs> I really don't know all the details of that, okay? No. If you go on the orangutan.org website, they probably have more of that, we'll call it the politics behind it that I don't know about, okay? Because mm -hmm. let me go with the try and keep us out of the politics. We just want to have a good time, help sure. the people and do the best orangutan. So that's probably a very tough question to answer, like over here in this country. Yes. Depends on which side you're on, yes. which you stand to gain or lose in the situation, <laughs> who you want to blame. So we don't go there, okay? Sure. <laughs> it's hard to understand that situation. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And staff, the, the medical staff mm -hmm. there, are, do they tend to be, obviously there's some people rotating in and out, but do they have a permanent staff there they do, as yeah. well? And what happens when veterinarians like myself go there, we help train them in the more sophisticated things and new things, but of mm -hmm. course, here in America, you know, we're somewhat limited as veterinarians. Unless we have our equipment, we really can't do things without ultrasounds and surgical equipment and x-rays. Mm -hmm. We can't diagnose and do that. And they have some of that there, but it's not as sophisticated as here. You bring your pet into me at the animal hospital, we can have a blood sample, thorough blood sample, accurate blood sample in 30 minutes. It's not going to happen over there so easily. Mm -hmm. So you got to stick with basic medicine. If something sophisticated happens, like a broken bone, to call in a special surgeon with equipment or go into the city, and it's not an easy thing to do. You have to sedate these animals. So it's not easy to give them medical care out in the field, yeah. different world. But those veterinarians there, I'm pretty impressed how skilled they are. They make do with what they have, and as long as you bring them the drugs that they need, like yeah. I mentioned, ivermectin, the parasiticide, anesthesia drugs, bandage material, antibiotics, we bring as much as we can when we go there, and that's a huge help to them. So everybody's keeping sort of a small flow going all the time. We try, huh? <laughs> I supply them with the drugs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how, how large is the facility there? Okay, so it holds something like 350 babies, and there's some, mm. you know, juveniles and adults there too, but about 350 of them. So that's a large compound. That's a lot that's of food lot. to feed them, a lot of people to take care of them. They have them in this area, and they take them out whenever they can, pretty much try and do it every day. But it's not easy. It takes a lot of labor, okay? And so it's like being in an orphanage, a big orphanage. Yes. Them. They're doing their best Constant they can. care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a picture of Doyak right there. So he's the dominant male, and this is the second trip. He uh, weighs 300 pounds, and you see how intimidating he is. Yes. So when he comes on the feeding platform, he actually does that pose. And he stares it this way, and he stares this way, and he stares at you, and he stares around to show people, I'm the boss, stay away. Yes. And he's got the brawn to back it up. And he's not 
more bark than bite. If, if you get too close, he is more bite than bark. This is his life. His territory is his life. So every day when there's food there, you can see his cheek pads, and you can yes. see his throat hanging out. Okay, he's a mature it. male. So he's 300 pounds of muscle. You can look at his arms and see how big they are. Mm -hmm. So the vocalization that they do, does that come from the, the pouch yeah, underneath down the chin? It's called the long call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it goes, they say, up to a mile into the forest. And you hear them, okay? Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's, pretty, a long way. it's to tell people, I'm here, this is my territory, and it's also to let the females know that I'm around. If you're receptive, yeah. you don't come and get me, okay? Here's my number. <laughs> kind of like humans. <laughs> yeah, here's my text, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's show the next picture. We can talk about that. So that's when I went there on the first trip. When I mentioned to you, when you examine a baby orangutan, they examine you as much as you examine yes. them. Here's an example. This is when he actually stood still for a couple seconds. <laughs> Before that, it took three people to hold him so I could even look at it in the eyes. And they put him on the ground, he settled down a little bit. So they're, it's just amazing, but they're so strong. That little guy there is as strong as two to three people easily. And he can just pull you out here. So you don't want to be feeding them any candy or anything. That <laughs> well, you're not supposed to, but they'll go through your pockets. They can smell very well, and they'll go through your pockets, and they'll grab you, and they'll, it's hard to get them away. If you've got peanuts, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And if you go where the large ones are, and you've got something, they grab your ankle, like I said, you're stuck until someone brings some food for them to let go, and they'll eat the food. Mm -hmm. And they're very gentle and dainty about it, okay? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's show the next picture. Mm -hmm. So that's what we would do every day. On the first trip in 1991, wow. that young man is a Dayak. So you go out in the forest with him every day, and we pretty much spend our time looking high up in the canopy in the trees, looking for orangutans. And we found them, they're there. Yeah. Then when we found one, we'd sit there, put our hammocks out, and we'd sit there and watch them all day long, till it got dark, and we'd walk back in the dark. And by the way, when you walk in the jungle with these young men, no flashlights, is it ruins their night eyes. Yes. So when you're walking there at night, early morning at 4 o'clock to go back to the spot, or when you're leaving in the dark at night to go back to the camp, no flashlight. You've got to walk right next to them behind them because trust they're moving them. fast. You've got to trust them because they don't want the eye. They have amazing skills. So pretty much after a couple of days, your neck's a little bit craning because you're looking up all the time. <laughs> and when you're not, the orangutan will move through the forest, eat, 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 stop for a few minutes when it did. We pull out the hammocks, and we sit there and lay there till they moved again. Sure, there was hammock on, hammock off, hammock on. At lunchtime, we sit there, you could nap a little bit. And then we waited till the orangutan made its nest. The Dayaks knew where that was, and we go back to camp and back the next morning. Four o'clock, we get up to get out there in the dark, put up the hammocks, and wait for the cicadas to give us our little concert in the morning. Yes. Light comes up, and next thing you know, the orangutan's moving. So it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, there's no sleeping through cicadas. Oh my God, it's a racket, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think there's another photo on. So that's the feeding platform on the first trip. So that man there is a the man where the large male orangutans were afraid of him. Okay, he only weighs 90 pounds. He's in charge of the camp. Mm. So he made the concoction of milk and rice every day, yeah. and then he would feed them, and they'd come to that feeding platform, and they would go ahead then and um, eat up a storm and stuff their faces. And that's <laughs> when the females got together. Otherwise, they'd stayed apart. So they were literally in the trees around that area waiting there until he came at 4 o'clock every day. They would jump down get their food. If a big male was there, they wouldn't come down until he came and checked things out. He's not there for the food. He's checking to see what's going yes. on. He would leave, okay? <laughs> and then occasionally, you see the platform there, the little monkey, the little macaques would put their hands up there and grab some rice through the cracks. You'd see them do that. So it's kind of cute what they would do. Mm -hmm. So I think we have another picture. So that's now the trip in 2012. You mm. can see now it's changed a little bit. First off, look at the quality of the photo. Yes. Camera equipment is dramatically better this. there. <laughs> the first one was actually a Minolta camera. It's slide film that was digitized. Mm -hmm. The second one here now is with, uh, obviously, a Canon professional digital yeah. camera. You know, So nothing had to be digitized. It's already that way. And so that's a park ranger. And already he fed the big male doyak. You saw that. And he's already fed the juvenile. He has plenty of food left. And now he feeds the females with their babies. And they can uh, stay there until they're done eating. And they do this every day. And the tourists come around, so they make their money now by the tourists paying to go up the Klotok ride still for two days yes. and to watch this feeding. And you get a great exposure. You can go right up next to them. You can be four, five, ten feet away from them as they're doing this, except for Doyak. You don't go close to him. No. Mm -hmm. How long does the feeding go on? Okay. How long does that process take? This takes a couple hours, uh -huh. and they do it pretty much here. So that's a lot of bananas, a lot of pineapples, and milk. Yeah. I don't know how they bring it out there every day. They do that, uh -huh. and these park rangers are dedicated for that. Uh -huh. So they care about them. They really do. You can tell. You have to. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Are there any more photos there? Let's check and see if we have any more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it, it, I think. That's the end of it? Okay, good. Okay, so so um, mm -hmm. the nests, are those branches or leaves or some combination? Or? Both of them, branches and leaves together. Okay, Just yeah. enough to keep and them. And they don't know how to make them as a baby. They need the mother to teach them how to make it. So it's pretty fascinating to watch how, and they're so careful out, and they just slowly just bend the leaves, and they bend them and bend them, and next thing, they're out. Okay. They got a skill. It's just amazing how they can do that, yeah. I'm surprised how they can do that so well. So the nice thing about the feeding platform on the second trip is um, when the females have fed, and you're in seats near them, they come right up next to you. I mean, we're closer than this, and you can just sit there oh. and look at them. They're very calm. They're used to people being around. Once they're fed, they're satisfied. They know we're not going to hurt the babies, and you get some fantastic photos right there with these babies. So if you go on the website, on my website for the animal hospital, you'll see some tremendous photos. Like, like oh, did someone teach them to pose like this? It was just, they knew what to do there right there. So, so you really get a good close-up interaction with the orangutans on the trip. You do. Unfortunately, as you're going down the claw talk on the second trip, the recent one, you see all the trees, the jungle, and you see the proboscis monkeys jumping up around. But on the other side of that is the denuded forest. Yeah. It's really kind of sad, okay? Mm. And that's the endemic problem in the whole world. There's a lot of people that need land for cattle, for food, for crops. In this case, it's palm oil. If you go on the orangutan.org website, they go over all the reasons why palm oil is being used. Mm. Now, these babies, as they're raised, they get older. Mm. What is the process for assuming they can find a place to release them? Mm -hmm. What is the process for releasing them? How do they get well, them to adapt? They have different locales or they have rangers watching things. And what they'll do is they'll take them to that area and they take them there they think it's safe where there's no poachers, where there's no illegal logging, where yeah. the palm oil plantations are probably not going to come in, and they release them there. They've already studied it. They have that part down pat. They're very sophisticated mm -hmm. on that. They know what's going to maintain the habitat, how many they can release in a certain area, what males are around. They have it down. They really do. Mm -hmm. So is there sort of a halfway house yeah. approach yes. to get them halfway there, there and then... So when you go up the Sakanya River and you stop at the Hotel Rimba, there's like a halfway house right there too for some of the juveniles. Uh -huh. So they got it in stages. They, it's, everything is different. Everything's the same in that each orangutan's got a different set of needs. They go with how much land they can get, what park ranges are available, and they do the best they can. They do a fantastic job. Okay, they really are. They're trying to save this animal from becoming extinct. Yes. And the predictions are it's going to go extinct because the habitat's going to go away. We're going to see them in zoos only. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's, uh, I'm curious, when, when they spend this much time bonding with humans and then they release them mm -hmm. finally to be on their own, mm -hmm. is there a risk to them that they still have this affiliation or e easy approach to humans? I don't think so, okay? Because once they, uh, they're, they won't release them unless they're c covered for that, yeah. Okay. And I think that they do fine. It's just the biggest problem is they'll come back for the food and the feeding platforms, but then they yeah. want to go off and be away from people then too. They usually have a baby, okay. the young ones, the males don't want to be around the people. So they sure. assimilate back to the normal orangutan lifestyle as long as they have the habitat for that. And if yes. they can get the food every day at the feed, they're dependent on their food. It's amazing. Yes. Okay. The males, not so much. The males have a big knowledge. They're powerful, they're big, and they go around a little bit. It's the females with the babies that are really vulnerable for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they don't seem to come back. Yeah. I don't know if they can release all of them, though. That's a dilemma. Yeah. It's hard to. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, when, they, when they do release them, how far away? Are they from where um, they were? It varies quite a bit. Depends on what habitat's available. They have different compounds. And so they'll take them to other areas where they think there's enough habitat, where there's park rangers are able to watch them and care for them and keep a track of them, and then where there's no one to go. So it could be 10, 15, 20 miles away in the area. Again, on the website, orangutan.org, they got more of that current information. I'm going back to the trips from the past, so they'll give you more current information on that. Sure. So they'll give you a better idea. And they go over the stories I hope release. It's pretty amazing. You get to see their names and the volunteers and the people that work there. It's a wonderful website. So I suggest to learn a lot more about this, go on the orangutan.org website. Okay. And learn about Dr. Galdicus. She went there in 1971 with her husband, Rob Brindamore after convincing Leakey to uh, promote it, which she yes. had to do, okay? And the two of them, her husband at the time and her, they just went all out. They would build a little platform in the middle of the jungle with nobody but the two of them, and they would sleep there and eat there and do their research together. Then they got divorced, okay? And then she married a local man 
for the political reason and to get power and to do the right thing. To, and so she just built this place up more and more and more from there. And then it became known and Earthwatch expanded it and now it's known around the world as a orangutan foundation international with organizations in Australia and the UK I think also too. So they're okay. around the world, they're very, and she speaks and talks all over the place. So, and she lives in this area here. So she's talked quite a bit in the zoos and things in this area. So if anyone's interested, go on their website and see if she's speaking in the area. Okay, yeah. very good. Now they've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. How many, do you know how many uh, they've had go through and be rehabilitated and released? Well, I know they talked about 350 okay. at one point in time when I was last there, okay. Okay. And I don't know the final outcome of all of them. The main thing is that these animals have been around five and 10 million years. Yeah. And so they're just doing their best. And 97% of them from the 1900s early to now, the population has decreased by 97%. Oh, that's amazing. So how much longer can they stay alive? And with the palm oil plantation, the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's accelerated. So Borneo has been deforested. Mm -hmm. Mm. So you can still see them there, they're still there, there's a fair amount of them there, but it's definitely on a precipitous decline. Yes. And they, some people predict they're going to go extinct, maybe in our lifetime, I don't know. Huh? Well, thank so goodness the there are people working in the opposite direction for yeah. them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we probably have some questions in the feed, sure. okay. I imagine. If Okay, hey, I have a few. Let me get my eyeballs on. Okay, me too. <laughs> so Andy says, uh, is there any kind of tracking program like with giraffes? That's a good question, because the tracking programs throughout the world of the giraffes and the lions and marine mammals is very sophisticated nowadays with the satellites and everything. But when I was there last in 2012, they didn't have that. But they may have that now, so that'd be good to go in a ring in Tanner and talk with them and see what they say. And that'd be a good idea to see what's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine tagging them would be a <laughs> you don't tag a them. project. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's so easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Malaya Davis wants to know who cuts your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Until I got this great barber that flew in from Michigan, okay? She came in a couple of days ago just to cut my hair and then she took off after that, okay? <laughs> That's it. All right, and uh, Alec wanted to know, to what extent do you try and cure a sick or injured orangutan? Okay, 100%, um, do whatever you can to treat them. Most of the time it's trauma and parasites so those are readily taken care of. If they get something like a tumor or something else, it may be difficult to do. But luckily, yeah. it's things that they know, you know, malaria type things, internal parasites, worms, uh, the traumas I talked about, infections, they can usually handle most of them, they can take care of that. So okay. they go to treat 100% best they can, okay? There's never anything saying, sorry, we're gonna euthanize you because we can't treat you. They will do whatever they can, yeah. yeah. They're very dedicated for that. Yeah. And based, based on your time there mm -hmm. and working in that environment, how many would you see in a day or a week that would need Very some few. kind of treatment? Most of the time when they confiscated a baby from someone where the mother was dead, it'd be malnourished. And that's just a matter of worming it and getting it proper nurturing care, warmth, hygiene, and feeding it, and they come back pretty good. So that's mostly what they would see most of the time, malnourished babies. Okay. So that's readily taken care of, yeah. And a lot of parasites. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's in the jungle, so there's tons of parasites. And that's the ivermectin. That drug is a wonder drug for them. That's what they want. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I think that that was the questions. Good. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So if you want more information, again, I highly recommend go on the orangutan.org website. They've got all this in much more detail. They're the experts. If you want a lot more photos, the lbah.com website and the photography link. Okay. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Look for those in the, in the video description when we get it posted up permanently. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Please go visit, support if you can. Oh, one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, if people want to, this one website seems like a good resource. Mm -hmm. um, is that a good starting point for them to get involved or find Heavily. out more? Oh, about? yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, for donations too, okay? Yes. <laughs> it starts with we that. You want to get there, yes. The contact them, email them, and tell them you want to volunteer and see what they say and go from there, yeah, because they're the ones in charge. They know more than anybody about this, okay? Okay. They've been there since 1971. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for a chance to help, mm -hmm. do something useful, and 
travel to an exotic place, mm -hmm. this is a great opportunity. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. We're happy to have you here. Tune in every week on Thursdays. We'll bring you fresh programming. Uh, we're celebrating our 100th year as a club this year. So hope you like what we're bringing you and uh, come back, tell your friends, share the content around and let people participate in as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, good night. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay.